Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Kate, Alex, and George for joining us today. Um, the purpose of the session today is really uh, just to have a general sort of discussion and for you to share valuable insights into uh, changes in consumer behavior. Um, we've had a few talks over the, the past couple of days and um, we at the Fashion Business School always put our customer central to all business decisions. Um, I don't think we can deny that consumer behavior has uh, been impacted by the recent uh, 18 months. And um, really the focus of the session today is actually how do we communicate with that uh, consumer? So um, thank you all for giving up your time. Uh, if each of you could just give a brief uh, introduction. Um, so if I could ask you, and this is only to do with the alphabet, if I could ask you, Alex, just to say a couple of words, please. Let's have an advantage. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is uh, Alex Timlin. I'm the Senior Vice President of Industries at Imasas, which is a fairly fluffy and meaningless job title. Uh, what I do is I actually sit between the commercial organization, so sales and client success, uh, the clients and the, the marketing, the product organization and the software business to look at what our point of view is around certain industries. And 80% of our business is, is retail. Uh, I also lead the, the go-to-market strategy for SAP's customer data and marketing products as well. So really delighted for Hannah to invite me and, and hopefully have something that you guys will, will find valuable in the next 40, 45 minutes. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and then if I could just ask George, if you wouldn't mind just uh, introducing yourself. Sure. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, good to meet you all. Uh, my name's George Yuanu. I am the managing partner at uh, Foolproof and vice president at Zensar, the parent company. We essentially... Um, Build out experiences, so um, and mainly customer sort of centric human experience. Uh, I've been working in digital for about twenty five years, probably more. Uh, mainly sort of expertise is in e commerce and uh, sort of building building out digital brands. Uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, yeah, hopefully I can add some value into this. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, George. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you pronounced your surname. I was racking my brains earlier trying to work out how to pronounce it. So thank you very much. Uh, Kate, over to you. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Kate Nightingale and I'm a consumer psychologist and have been running my consultancy for I don't know how long now. Uh, I think it's eight years or more. Uh, but basically, we're a human experience consultancy and we work with uh, retail, hospitality and tech brands across brand strategy, customer experience, design, and insight and innovation. So some of we work absolutely across every channel, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we worked with Swarovski on their new store concept, uh, which is uh, already uh, one of the stores is available on Oxford Street. So go ahead and uh, critique it, please. Um, we working, for example, at the moment, so I'm a chief behavioral officer for uh, Adaptista, which is uh, launching later this year, uh, Adaptive Fashion, Beauty and Mar Lifestyle Marketplace. Uh, we're also working with, uh, launching later this year, uh, again, <laughs> um, a radically transparent, sustainable uh, fashion brand in uh, casual wear and loungewear. Um, so really kind of extremely varied um, work, as well as we have a number of clients in homeware and furniture section. So um, work is extremely varied um, from um, PR campaigns, such as working with Klarna last year, uh, to um, you know, full-blown brand strategies and really translating that into amazing brand designs and experiences. So um, all basically very mixed back, as you can see, of our things, but all backed up, obviously, by behavioral sciences. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, perhaps you could uh, start off by giving sort of a brief summary of, yeah, the sort of recent changes in consumer behavior. So you know, we are we are coming out of this very odd 18 months um but actually you know how does the consumer look you know what what are we going to be faced with within the world of fashion retail fashion business yeah sure so um every single time i look at this kind of bigger macro and micro changes uh, throughout consumer behavior it is extremely useful to go back to muscle's hierarchy of needs um 
I hope everyone by now knows Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, I remember a few years ago asking about it on a conference. It was like three hands up out of 200. So <laughs> that, you know, that wasn't good. But now, by now, um, I've noticed that pretty much everyone knows. And it's such a valuable tool to, to really look at this because um, regardless of where we are as human beings or as society or particular country on a level of that development. So for example, we can be on a self-actualization like majority of the UK is. Um, moving towards self-transcendence needs. So these are the only needs where the effect of uh, fulfillment of the need is actually external. So this is where our sustainability, social impact, charitable endeavors, all those kind of businesses uh, play um, part. But there is still a very limited um, group of people that are actually on that level of development, let's face it. When we do buy sustainable, it's we buy it because it allows us community or we buy it because we can show off uh, to supposedly be sustainable and so on and so on. So we actually buying them driven by the lower levels of needs. Um, now, one thing that I really liked um, from this pandemic was that people were forced to reevaluate themselves and really start to actually work on themselves. This was probably one of the only benefits um, that we all experienced. Um, and that's where I started seeing a lot of kind of rise into higher self-awareness and self-consciousness, which also therefore moved to compassion and oneness and kindness. And this is where, you know, where obviously sustainability started gaining um, stronger voice as well, as well as social impact, as well as really making brands accountable for social impact, regardless of whether it's part of their strategy, whether they're actually earning money from it, making brands basically responsible for the impact that they normally have um, because brands are everywhere in every aspect of our life whether we realize it or not the impact on all of our relationships and how we think on our attitudes and our beliefs on everything on our stereotypes even to you know to different groups of people so we start to, started kind of keeping brands accountable a little bit more, even though that already was there, but that obviously strengthened even more because we've seen brands that weren't doing anything or were doing the wrong stuff as well. And that's really sort of filtered the brands. Yes, you really are for us, for human beings, not just for customers, but also for employees, right? We've seen so many brands being bad mouthed for bad treatment of employees. But equally, you know, yes, you're still kind of earning money and that's okay, uh, but you're making sure that that money is used well. So that was the positive development for me. Um, now, obviously, other levels of needs that were heavily impacted were belongingness and safety. Now, obviously, across belongingness, we started seeing the impact on local um, consumption and really kind of the strength of the community. Now, Brands setting up brand communities is nothing new. Uh, it already has been happening and it already was starting to be a trend for brands to do that. Now it's a must have. And according to me, it's the next biggest differentiating factor between the brands following things like purpose, authenticity, and you know the, the sort of key aspects that really have been running the show over the last uh, couple of decades. Now, Across that, um, you know, build up of brand communities, whether you do it full blown and really kind of create amazing strategies like some of my clients that we did that um, for them, uh, or whether you just kind of really have a better conversation with your customers on social media, that can also do it. Um, now, another thing that comes from intimacy, is, sorry, from belongingness is intimacy. We have been seeing more and more of this. Notice how people were responding better to the smaller brands because of their openness, because of the ability to share their inspiration, their, you know, their joy, their passion, everything, their, you know, everyday life, you know, talk about the story of the founder, share their employees and other bits and pieces. It's not that difficult to do for a big brands and they've done some of them. You know, I remember reading uh, this article in a uh, um, KLM magazine in, you know, in the flight a few years ago which was basically an interview with one of their directors asking why she loves her job. <laughs> it's not that difficult, yet we haven't been really kind of used to doing it as bigger brands, but smaller brands have been gaining exactly because of that, and especially during pandemic. Now, 
that and the intimacy can be delivered in lots of different ways, but just a simple way is really kind of sharing your story and sharing your inspiration a little bit more openly and having more of a conversation, especially on social media, which seems to be very kind of, you know, for customers, very much like, you know, they came in for a coffee, you know, to have a chat with you. That's literally how they're approaching it. Now, safety. Um, I'm not really even talking about basic physical safety. That's just default. That's hygiene. Everyone should be doing it. I don't care who you are. You should have, you know, masks, uh, everything else, sanitizers, all the basic stuff, filtration systems. That's nothing weird, right? You should have some special way of packing to ensure that the virus doesn't come through. That's obvious. I'm talking about a psychological and emotional safety that brands haven't been doing very well about. One of the basic aspects of delivering um, sense of safety on the psychological and emotional level is sense of control. Now, we have been losing sense of control a lot, whereas pre-pandemic, sense of control has been rising amongst customers. That's why we have sharing economy, right? We wanted to control things. That's why we're keeping brands accountable because we want to control them. And that already has been really strong before the pandemic and obviously pandemic no thank you you don't have any control over your life you can't get out of the house you can't do this you can't do no, forget about anything that you think you can do normally no you can't so where's my control in my spending right so we've seen people going a little bit over the board with their spending right because you know it's a natural reaction to impulsivity. Impulsivity is a natural reaction to the lack of control as well. Now, obviously, that is not healthy because that impacted on you know on a lot of the um, on a lot of our finances and everything else. So brands started playing with okay, so how can we instill more sense of control in customers? And that's for example, when I was working with Klarna on a campaign, that's exactly what that campaign was about. Uh, and that wasn't just the only campaign. We've done three since then just about sense of control. It's, you know, everyone. But the basic stuff are co-creation and personalization. That's the easiest way to get some sense of control to customers. So those are really kind of the key driving forces that will be going forward. So think about community. Think how we can increase the sense of control by personalization, by co-creation. Think how you can increase the sense of intimacy. Maybe adapt your tone of voice, for example. Maybe kind of have a little bit more of a conversation on social media. And then think how you can really make a difference in social impact that isn't about your bottom line, because that will still be driving a lot of choices, regardless of whether it's sustainability, disadvantage youth, or anything else that you are investing in. It has to obviously be consistent with your brand, but the key is, you know, really those kind of elements that, are, that I've just discussed. I think it was a bit of longer than five minutes. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very detailed overview. Um, I think, uh, yeah, understanding the psychology of the consumer. Um, we had um, IMRG in um, on uh, Monday, and they were actually sharing with us some of the patterns that they've seen in actually uh, consumer um behavior and uh purchasing across different categories but also this sort of uh shift very much towards digitalization um and uh so george 25 years in the in the digital world perhaps you could uh share with us some of kind of the insights that you have witnessed over the past 18 months sure thanks Anna. um i would i would say that Although it's a you know a health crisis that, that turned up, it was actually a big opportunity for for businesses. Um, they we saw obviously stating the obvious a lot of online uh, shooting up and you know bricks and mortar going down purely you know purely because of the government restrictions. But I think what was really quite good to see in businesses is decisions, right? So. People would have all the time in the world in, in pre pre crisis. They would think about things. They would plan. They would roadmap. They would invest significant amounts. And what it created was speed, velocity. So velocity in trying to get things out. So, for example, those who didn't have um, an, an e-commerce function would actually then create something. If they didn't have 
you know, supermarkets that didn't have click and collect or, you know, weren't able to do things. They were, they were hacking things that normally the risk wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't want to do that risk. And um, so that was great to see because we've always been preaching around, you know, moving that roadmap and, and creating velocity in engineering, in design thinking, everything you do should be with purpose and with speed. Uh, so we saw a lot of that velocity coming up. And we, we I think we, we had a very sort of mixed vertical uh, in terms of our, our clients. So we had uh, some in, in fashion, some in uh, sort of groceries, we have banking, insurance. So we go across the verticals, healthcare, um, media and entertainment. And while some were sort of hesitant to do things, others would be picking up that velocity and, and doing a lot more. So um, one of the clients, a home media uh, sort of client who, you know, people are staying at home, they're, they've got nothing to do. They're, they're looking at trying to get bigger broadband bundles, you know, um, trying to increase their packages and things like that. So that was a huge opportunity for them to accelerate their offering. So I think that was one of the big behaviors that we saw that, um, people wanted to make decisions quickly and have that that hacking mentality a little bit like get it out there test and iterate and see what happens and and that creates a, a sort of a good um opportunity for us at foolproof and zensar because we 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 sort of concentrate on insight and data so whether it's uh you know data insight coming from web analytics or creating panels of one to one interviews and finding out what consumers want it was really helping them devise their roadmap. So which of, which which do you think are priorities from inside the organization versus this is what your consumers want, this is their priority and helping them map those and getting those things out. So I think that was a huge uh, mind shift actually in, their, in, in organization's mindset to, to just get on with things. So um, that that was a, a great thing and, and seeing a lot more innovation. So I, I can't remember mm -hmm were saying it but there was a lot you know more innovation done during this crisis than the last decade or, or two decades in terms of some of the business transformations um i'll keep it short i'll stop talking there but that i think that was the major thing it was it was velocity of decision making and comfort level like that people want to take more risk in just seeing what's out there to maximize opportunity um so would you say there was almost so much chaos sort of brought about by the by the onslaught of the pandemic that people were just like, do you know what, let's let's just let's just try, let's just innovate, let's let's just give it a go and absolutely. And and that's not just, you know, um the, the organizations that were were you know large. You, you you saw a lot of new businesses being set up. People on furlough were creating new business mm. opportunities. They were going on to uh, you know, Kate was talking about crowdsourcing and and those sort of platforms that would just allow me to create a set, you know, a, a set of products. So in fashion, I saw, uh, you know, even on my personal LinkedIn, there were um, agencies that would were, were posting. My my child decided to create a brand, and they created design T-shirts. They found someone who would print small quantities of T-shirts. They would build a a shop using one of the you know online shopping platforms. So there was a lot more sort of entrepreneurial thoughts with people's time. So from from kids in in college all the way through to you know maybe um, you know people on furlough or maternity leave, they they were they were seeing that opportunity that didn't exist. The amount of masks that I saw being designed and marketed and things like that. So I think it was quite it was quite good for all business sizes. So entry into business, but also established sort of uh, brands that you you would know and love so um so lockdown did mean that you know for a, a big part of the time we were sort of behind closed doors but obviously communication continued because we did have these uh digital channels um alex um perhaps you could just uh shed a little bit of light because immersa is actually uh, promote themselves as the only omni-channel customer engagement platform so um what what does you know uh as we're sort of moving out of the kind of pandemic and we've seen stores opening and we've seen move back to the physical world what does that actually mean sort of from the omni-channel perspective 
Yeah, I think it's a term that's used a lot, but I think particularly for, for the guys here. So we work with 4,000 clients globally uh, and uh, ranging from, you know, some of the fast growing brands that George was talking about. So Gymshark and Lounge Underwear in the UK, where they're, they're growing into kind of billion plus valuations from people just starting businesses in their bedrooms as, as kind of teenagers. So I think the, the founding team of Lounge Underwear uh, are, are all in their 20s. Chief customer officer, CEO, CFO, COO, they're all in their 20s. And they started a, a direct-to-consumer business looking at an underserved segment, which is, you know, why, why does an underwear fit and, and how do I make it more comfortable, not just uh, invest in, you know, the, going into Marks and Spencer's fitting room and, and speaking to someone in their 50s to tell you what to wear. It's the, there are certain things that have changed, but in that example, a lot of it's for the better. And I think when we're talking about omni-channel, I think the, the key thing for us is, and one of my favorite examples is the Fraser's group. So for, for everyone on this call who doesn't have a gray beard, which is myself and George, um, Sports Direct is not a brand that you know and love. So the Fraser's group is a multi-billion dollar fashion uh, business that was built as a value-based retailer. But what people expect from a value-based retailer has changed and they've had to pivot their entire business model looking into what customers are expect from how their staff are paid on a website, how their materials are sourced and built, but also the experiences in stores as well. And how they're looking to do that better is to say, look, let's start with a better digital presence first. Let's look at something cleaner, something more modern, something a little bit more personalized and look at not you running around in a bargain bin for something that's going to be five quid and you may or may not wear it, and may or may not keep it for more than eight weeks, but look at something that you need right now. So I think what Omnichannel has been really about is you're sitting right now with a mobile phone that enables you to find anything you want from anywhere you want. And a brand's response is to make sure that they have the right inventory, the right stock and the right positioning to give you what you want. So I think this has been a, the biggest shift in terms of what's going on is that consumers are in control, not only of what you want to buy, but how you want to buy. And the biggest thing that we've seen uh, over the last year, and we managed uh, on, on average 10 billion uh, personalized communications a month for the clients that we've got. And the, the clients that we're working with use our platform to manage their customer data, look for trends and to communicate with their customers. The customers they're now dealing with is 3 billion customer records. Two years ago, that was 1.2 billion. There has been an explosion in people who are actually dealing with brands for the very first time. For the vast majority of people on this call, you're used to buying online. But there are many people who actually made their first ever online purchase with a brand that they might have been loyal to for five or 10 years, but made their very first brand, uh, brand purchase digitally last year. 40% of all the purchases we measured across those billions of consumers were the purchases, first time purchases to that brand. And some people, we had no visibility of them ever making an online purchase across uh, some of the world's largest brands. So it's a, it's a really a, a two horse race where you've got people who are very, very savvy, who are saying, I want you to meet me where I am. I want you to sell and help me find the products that I want in Instagram, TikTok, and Snap. There are other people that are completely alien to that environment who struggle to work a laptop, never mind a mobile phone, who are looking to have their needs met. And for brands, they need to look at how do they deal with the changes to the customers that they have for the last 10 years, but how do they attract new customers that are using platforms and have expectations that the brands simply aren't equipped to meet with? And I think that's a really interesting thing for, for everyone on this call is to look at how do you look after the clients you've already got whilst also attracting the clients that you want who completely, in terms of the channels they use, they're using messaging apps. They're spending time on social media. They're not browsing on a desktop computer and might not even own one. And when we're talking about omnichannel, that's what we're talking about as a business is how do I help people get a great store experience and send the right email campaigns to get them to get there when you're in the 40s? But then how do I also make sure that I've got the right advertising audiences on Facebook and Instagram and I've got the right messaging strategy for WhatsApp and Messenger that enables you to build a relationship with a brand on your own terms and have the brand use that data to use the, the insight to give you the recommendations about the products you want to find because people don't want to do the legwork. So it's, it's a long answer because it's a complicated topic. But what we're talking about in Omnichannel is how do we make it easy for the customer by engaging with them where they want to be and how they want to be met and recognizing that not every customer is the same. So, so, so how, how, how do you actually achieve that, you know, with, with kind of like almost customers at different ends of the spectrum, I suppose. 
I think that this is where there's a lot of talk about like AI and technology and what does it actually mean? I'll break it down into really, really base terms, which is what, what technology is very good at right now is finding associations and patterns. And one of the things that we've done with uh, not just people like Sports Direct, but with Gymshark and, and also a brand that's near and dear to my heart and all of our brown, it's like a luxury swim, uh, swimwear brand. And one of the hardest things to do as a fashion brand is to launch a new product. So if you're going to launch a new product to a customer, you don't have any data on sentiment about how that customer feels about the product because it's new. And what we're starting to see is people using technology for things like image and pattern recognition. So to say to a customer, what are the products you bought in the past? Looking at the imagery, the fabric, the look, the cut of the products that you've bought in the past and using that to make decisions about what products you're actually going to make for a customer. And I think this is where the technology is getting really interesting is that a lot of people are buying online, which means that there's a lot of information available. As long as the consumer is comfortable with opting in and sharing that information with a brand, what you get back in return is no longer just a 5% discount offer and a generic piece, but it's actually an opportunity for a brand to make products and services just for you. And I think the people like the, the pretty little things of the world and the, the, the Boohoo group, why they get a bad rep is because they're not necessarily sustainable and they're not in keeping with a lot of the important trends that Cape was looking at. But what they do phenomenally well is they look at what you're browsing, they look at what you're buying, they ask you questions and do surveys on social media or via email, and they make their products based on what's trending right now. And I think that level of agility can only be achieved with technology. And we're very lucky to be one of the largest providers of the world of providing personalized technology that is really about rewarding existing customers with loyalty and repeat uh, and repeat offers. And the way you do that is pay attention to what people buy, pay attention to what people look at, show them more stuff they like, and don't show them stuff they're not interested in. And I think that's where, uh, as, as consumers, everyone's at. A brand can spam you with all the stuff that they want, but if you don't like it, you don't have to engage anymore. You don't have to walk into Dorothy Perkins. You can go into anywhere you want, find anything you want. And it's the people who are in that mold of shipping units are in a difficult spot because everyone on this call has choice, has options, and has your own unique particular style. And brands need to recognize and adapt to that to say, how do I treat you as an individual, but also recognize that I need to have millions of customers to have a sustainable growing business. And that's the bit where technology is really exciting is the blend of the art. How do I build products that people want and the execution? How do I personalize an experience for a million people at exactly the same time? Uh, you can't do one without the people and you can't do the other without the technology. And I think anyone who's in fashion should, should really embrace so particularly on the marketing side of things, learn a little bit more about technology, not about the coding, but what it can do for you on your behalf, just to figure out how you can actually carve out a role in these really digitally savvy and, and really fast growing businesses that we see cropping up, as George mentioned. Alex, I might come back to you shortly and just ask, you know, in a minute, how, how, how we can perhaps take that and make sure as a university that we're actually preparing our graduates for, for the brave new world. But um, George, um, at Foolproof, it's it's kind of uh, very much about making uh, digital uh, a reality. So, um, you know, at, could, perhaps you could just give a little bit of an overview of, of, you know, what you actually, you know, what Foolproof actually does as business. Sure. Um, so, as I said, we're, we're an experienced company. So um, we, we, we essentially solve companies' challenges. So if there's a pain point, or you know, a uh, you know, design on a strategic level rather than coloring pixels. Uh, I'm being quite facetious with that one. So, you know, it's 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 really about design thinking and how you can solve those problems and challenges. So, for example, um, we we look at new revenue streams or you know where where we can help uh, get close to the clients and the, and the, and their customers. So it could be a business that's a distributor. Or a manufacturer wanting to get more consumer feedback and cut out the middle person and so we, we have a, a mixture of uh, strategy design technology that then really goes across three phases to to shape something to then nail it and then scale it um, and you know it, it, and it can be lots of different uh, things so um, through for, for mainly sort of e-commerce and let's say fashion and apparel brands and, and department stores, we do a lot of conversion rate optimization. So really looking at the process of the, you know, the, the funnels on, on the website. So looking at the different pages, the entry points, looking at the data, looking at consumer behavior, and then making recommendations 
whether it's on design or feature and functionalities to then help in, in creating a better experience. Now, I say that because sometimes conversion can be quite a dark art as well. So um, you know, with banking, it would be terrible if we just drove conversion and made people apply for credit cards and mortgages that didn't suit them. And then you get a bad customer experience. So we're very much on the white hat uh, area of conversion rate to say, how do we convert customers and have given them a better experience? So you, you always have to pair up those, those two metrics. Like, did they have a good experience? Was it easy to use? Was it pleasurable versus did they actually buy the right product? And will they come back and, and have loyalty? We won't do one without the other. So um, that's really our specialty. And I, I guess I, I sort of USP, um, our unique selling point is that we can actually then take that through into technology and and build out the apps and infrastructure. So uh, we, we've got about 11,500 developers uh, across the globe that, that, that build out these operations uh, across different verticals. So um, yeah, it's every day's a, a different challenge and we get to work with so many different brands and uh, different problem points from, like I said, creating new revenue streams to understanding you know, the clients more, understanding industry as well. So we do quite a lot on the future of and, and do some uh, great research piece. I'll actually put it into the chat. Um, we did something, for example, on um, during COVID around dirty tech. So looked at utilization of ATMs and in the supermarkets, did people want to touch the, the you know, the card terminals? Did they want to uh, stop using cash and things like that? So we, we did quite a lot of research and behavior on how technology was interacting and you know, hardware broke in, in thousands. Um, people had to keep getting replacements because they were all putting sanitizer, for example, all the time. And those terminals weren't used to having sanitizer being sprayed, you know, multiple times a day. And, and you know, the units were breaking. So there was a lot of things like that that just COVID created um, that we just found interesting. So we gathered the data we then put it back to the businesses and say, look, here's some opportunity spaces. Here's what I think you can do. Uh, and then we break those up into small projects for them. Uh, whether they do that in-house or through us is, is sort of their choice, but yeah, quite a wide variety of things, but majoring on consumer experience and um, making the world a better place. Brilliant. So, so putting the customer first always. Um, and I, I, I suppose, uh, you know, Alex, when you were talking, you were talking about, you know, personalization of, of messages and you were talking about all the different sort of channels of communication, you know, TikTok, Snap, uh, and then sort of, you know, just just newsletter and, and web page. But um, I mean, there are some brands that are sort of favoring just just one channel of communication instead of many channels of communication, you know, looking ahead and sort of the complexities of perhaps personalizing the way you communicate with customer, you know, how, how does how does the future look as concerns communicating with your market? I think it's for anyone who's got an interest in kind of the, the consumer marketing piece of it. I think that the key thing to recognize is that this choice leads to a, a real big challenge for a business, which is how do I differentiate between someone who is seeing my brand for the first time, either in the physical world or, or on a website, or someone who's actually been exposed to potentially thousands of messages, like uh, the average person work, uh, walking down the street in a, a major city like London or, or New York, when you put together what they're seeing physically and what they're seeing digitally, sees more than a thousand adverts per day, 1000 per day. So there's a lot of noise out there and cutting through the noise is about recognizing how do you look at signals and inputs to make better decisions about of the thousands of things you could put in front of a customer, which one's most likely to appeal to that individual? So I think the key thing for everyone is to start looking at what do I know about a customer and how do you actually make it valuable for the customer to give you information? So none of this creepy Facebook stalking, Cambridge Analytics stuff, but how do you actually get a little bit more of a two-way interaction with people around? Uh, we're seeing a huge increase in things just like simple survey and simple kind of uh, 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 digital response mechanisms to say, look, when you're visiting a brand, they'll tell you now, here are like five or six different categories that we think are, are interesting. Let us know the two or three that apply to you. The reason they're doing that is they've got potentially a thousand different SKUs. 
How do I choose which of the thousand SKUs to put in front of the four placeholder slots I've got in front of a, a homepage on a mobile device? And the average person is spending less time on each page that they're looking at, less time scrolling, unless it's on a social network. On a social network, people will scroll the, the length of the Empire State Building every single day. It's my favorite stat. It's bizarre, but I like it. Um, but uh, on, a, on a mobile website, people are just now hardwired to be impatient and angry. So if someone can't find what they want to get in three clicks, there's a very physical, emotional response to not getting what you want. So I think when we're talking about emotion, uh, emotional connections and talking about the, what brands have a responsibility to do for customers, there's a lot of complexity that's involved because some people want to know about the product, the materials, the ethics and the sustainability. Other people want to buy a dress for five quid and they want it tomorrow and then they want to throw it away by Saturday. These people have different needs. And if you don't meet their needs, they're going to kick off and get angry very, very quickly. And it's like, how do you start looking at not just selling to customers, but building relationships with customers that recognize what are their trigger points and what are their opportunities and start using technology to make it a little bit easier to reduce some of that friction and the engagements that you have with brands. And I think anyone who's trying to do that over a single channel is going to have a tough job, but people can have a consistent approach to customers. And then it doesn't really matter whether you're doing on an email, an SMS, an MMS, or a WhatsApp messenger. They're all just messages at the end of the day. But what you need to look at is, What's the right product, the right context, and the right way to approach this customer? Are they discount-led and value-led, or are they values-led? There are different types of customers with different needs, and the more we understand them, whether you want to engage in the Stein and the K chat around whether Maslow is the right way to do it or not is a different story, but there are different opportunities to understand what customers want from you. The biggest thing I'd recommend for anyone who's interested in the discipline is how do you make it valuable for a customer to want to give you the information that you need to personalize their experience, to make it easier for them so that they don't just swipe, uh, swipe right and go to the next one? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the thing, isn't it? You know, um, I suppose enticing the customer to sort of give some sort of feedback. So, so I, you know, you mentioned surveys, but it, it, to do with like how long a customer might spend looking at a particular screen for, or a particular like a uh like page or you know I, I suppose it's about looking at their reaction time looking at their sort of the way they react what they click on what they don't click on as well as perhaps actually asking them directly you know i mean i i you know you get those messages don't you where an ad comes up and you clear it off and then they go well you know why did you not like that ad you know why wasn't it right or you know why didn't you like that product um so it's a combination of the of the two then would you say? Exactly. And it, I think your point's a great one is that sometimes it's not the product that's annoying, it's the experience. It's, we had to redesign our technology completely for, for mobile devices because mobile yeah, websites gosh. were built for clicking with a mouse. It wasn't built for scrolling. Yeah. With so people are like habitually looking to do things. And when a website doesn't work, you get angry, you get frustrated. So what we had to look at in our personalization technology was how do we make stuff thumb size clickable and how do we make it easier to swipe and scroll through to make it a, a little bit more organic with how people react, but then recognizing that that technology was useless on a website. So you need to differentiate the experience for customers who are expecting different things. And I think that's the, the key thing is that it's a tricky landscape for people who are coming into the industry because it is very, very complex. And there are different needs in different environments and different channels have different requirements. But overall, it's about what's your strategy of the business to say, what are my values? What do I stand for? What's my value proposition? And being really clear about which segment of the market you want to get because you're not going to get it all because there's simply yeah. too much choice and too much competition so i think that's the the being laser focused on product proposition value and, and, and customer customer value is is something that is the the really interesting area of, of fashion and retail because the more you can understand about what customers want the more it can inform any part of fashion you want to work in whether it's product design whether it's in merchandising whether it's in buying or whether it's in more of the the, the management or the the execution pieces it's everything centered around how do i build a product that a customer wants to buy and gets values from but that's now wrapped in the experience that they get when they're actually transacting and engaging with your brand, whether it's in a physical store on a mobile device, the, the nuances are very clear, but the, the principles are the same. It's all about serving customers and whether it's digitally or in store, it's about understanding what people want and doing your best to give it to them with as least pain as possible for you and for them. 
Yeah, and customers are demanding, aren't they? So, you know, this is constant pressure for you to keep adapting and evolving and changing and and sort of, you know, gosh, I think about, you know, Amazon's got a huge percentage of the market, but actually the experience of shopping in Amazon, you know, from a kind of visual and kind of, you know, sort of information even perspective is pretty basic. But, you know, you as a customer, you opt for Amazon because it's next day delivery and you know they're going to deliver and you've probably paid a subscription, which means you get free delivery. So, you know, I suppose it's understanding all of that and making sure that you're catering. To George's them. point, it's built for conversion. The whole Amazon business, not just a website, the whole business is built to conversion. You tell them what you want. They're like, we've got it cheaper, faster and better than anyone else. It's not built for discovery. It's not built to help you yeah. find things you don't want. Yeah, it's built to have a very transactional relationship. And I think that's the opportunity for people is you can't compete with Amazon like that. They might buy Morrison's, we'll see how that goes. But what you can compete on is the experience, the connection that yeah. you have between a brand and a customer. I think that's the, the area of innovation and opportunity for us all. Can I just so what, yeah, go um, on, George. So your, your Amazon you know, experience is a great example, right? They, they turn down many things if it doesn't hit. So they're a client of ours. They, Convenience, price, and speed. Those three things have to be part. If they don't add to convenience, price, and speed, it doesn't get put on the roadmap. Making something prettier, making something different doesn't, doesn't add up. Um, and to give you an example of what you mentioned before around how can you serve those different companies and customers, uh, Alex's point around technology being an enabler, you know, try it out. If there's anyone there that's using AB and multivariate testing, you should try all these different scenarios out. So we, we've done things where at lunchtime, let's say, you strip out the reviews, the videos and things like that, because you know they've got a certain period of time to browse, make a decision and purchase something quickly. Uh, weekends, you could then be a bit more social, you can add videos, you can do lots of different uh, things because they're, they're in that browsing mode. So really using your technology to change and personalize the pages and the experience depending on time of day, location, those different things is, is a great way. You, you, know, you know that you're on mobile, don't load them with heavy video stuff if they're yeah. on Wi-Fi and, and those sort of things. So I think testing out and using that technology to better the experience is a, is a huge um, must, right? Don't, don't think of blanket experiences anymore. Think of one-to-one -one and personalizing and contextualizing things. Um, okay, brilliant. So, so really sort of, yeah, putting your customer first, understanding, you know, what your customer needs, because your customer needs are different depending on the time of day or the time of week. Um, yeah, and, and, and the luxury of having that, that time at the weekend to perhaps explore and investigate is when you're going to perhaps share some of the more heavy kind of uh, lengthy communication, I suppose. Um, so, um, Alex, earlier on, you just sort of uh, touched on, you know, looking ahead and, you know, uh, how, how our graduates potentially could be industry ready or need to be industry ready. So, you know, part of these sessions is to, to ensure that we are preparing our graduates for the industry. So uh, perhaps you could share with us, you know, what, what do you think the industry is looking for from business graduates? I think it's a good question. Uh, I, I do a, a lot of work with the, the, the DMA in the UK, uh, particularly on um, the, the talent development side of things. And one of the key things that's been really, really difficult to find is, is the, the mindset in all honesty. So it's technology isn't about understanding one bit of kit and how to operate it. It's more about understanding how technology actually works in a business context. So I think the, the biggest thing for everyone to get used to, whether you like it or not, is working with data, be that on Excel or, or, or different, it's all business in any discipline is data-led. And if you find a business that isn't data-led, run away because they're probably not going to be that successful because it's the, the, the nature of the beast. And yeah. that's whether it's in design, whether it's in merchandising, whether it's in marketing or, or whether it's even in the storefront, everyone's uh, working in uh, units and metrics and everyone's measured. Everything's measured in a business. So I think understanding the, the data side of things, even if it's not your passion, it's a necessary evil, I think is a, is a really key piece of what's going on. And I would really encourage people, particularly those who are interested in, 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 in the marketing or the digital side of things, is to not get sucked into 
boring project management tasks. Uh, anyone who's running a marketing course, I apologize in advance, but this drives me nuts anyway. It is marketing isn't a, a creative discipline in a lot of businesses. It's about shifting tasks from one thing to another. I think having a real passion about what makes people tick is a more interesting thing that goes with it. So if you're curious and you're genuinely looking at what are the problems a business is looking to solve for, what are the technologies that they're using to be able to do it, and what's the data that they have that's actually helping them make decisions, those are the things that make people very, very successful very, very quickly. Uh, I've got people on my team who are kind of global vice presidents in their, in their mid-20s, and they came from outside of the industry, but they're just intellectually curious people who are looking at, how do I understand better? What does a business want to achieve? What do my customers want to achieve? And who in the business has data that helps us understand how well we're doing in both camps? And I think anyone who's looking for a grounding in business, look at those types of things, which is how do you understand more about how businesses measure success? How do you understand more about measurable success with customers and needs? And how do you be a little bit more data-driven in decision-making? I think that's something that's a valuable skill set. Coding languages and everything else that goes with it is, 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 is not the only piece of technology. It's about the understanding the business applications of technology and how technology can help businesses build better relationships with customers. Yeah, so in effect, you know, with all this data, not necessarily understanding how to how to crunch it and, you know, how to, how to write algorithms, but more about actually you know, how, how can we use this data to, to find out more and what data do, do we need to perhaps answer some of the questions that, that we that are unanswered at the moment, so to speak. And, and, and asking those questions in the room. So I, I, I can't, I'm almost technologically inept, but what I'm good at is, is sitting with people and looking at understanding what do we want to achieve and why. And I think that as long as you can be in a, in a place where you can collaborate with people and have have the right questions to make the use of other people's skills, then it does mean that you can go very, very quickly into a lot of different directions guided by your own interests and your own passions. But you need that firm foundation of how do I use ideas and concepts and, and ask questions that are grounded in, in facts and data, not just expert opinion, uh, just to make sure that you can bring people along for the ride when you're putting forward suggestions, ideas and, and, and new opportunities. Okay, brilliant. Um, thank you. Uh, George, and anything you'd like to to add? Uh, I think, yeah, Alex brings a great point um, with data, I think. And I think if, if I make the, the assumption that everyone's kind of from a creative background because of, you know, the, this, this round table and UAL, I think where creatives tend to not do themselves, uh, you know, the, the, the best sort of uh, services when you've got as a creative you always want to carry on pushing and pushing and changing things so in one way it's great because we have a sense of pivot and you know you don't get stuck on an idea but there is that constant of you know evolution that you have to keep going through that whole creative process and you know if i give uh one of my team two days to do something or three weeks it's never enough right so you might as well stick to the shortcomings. so i think learning to be creative in the certain skills. So when you're creating, you know, around fashion, if you're creating your your collections and you're building out an idea, fine, be creative. But then when you're trying to apply it to business, that's the point where you have data, and that's the way you have to just say, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? Uh, and a great example, <coughs> excuse me, going back to MVT um, and A/B testing, there was a massive retailer uh, largest actually in uh, the us on on fashion and they plowed an enormous amount of money millions into on location shoots for their collection so you're thinking you know models the location shoot hair and makeup lighting photography massive um, amounts of money and we did a test those photographs versus 3D mannequin shot in a studio, you know, just chuck them on the mannequin. We did it with flesh colored mannequin, transparent mannequins. And we also did it flat on a table. So just getting the, the garment, throwing it on the table, scrunching up a little bit as well, mm -hmm. um, shooting that. Absolutely zero conversion uh, cha change. Wow. So they actually streamlined their business and they were able to get things to market quicker by not having that, that collection. So they still did the photo shoots for maybe, you know, the collection, autumn, spring, summer, and a couple of shots, but they didn't have to do every single variation and things. So I think that's where 
creative struggle because you think that's the that's what we need to do because you're passionate in that area but i think you know alex's point on knowing where to do to change this is the bit that i'm creative in this is the where i'm a business and this is where i'm focused on data and you know helping you know, helping yourself understand those boundaries i think is, is something that you know i struggle with every day and uh if people want to look up ooda loops um it's uh, ooda loops it's what fighter pilots uh pilots do um to make quick decisions and that's what the, the key to fast startups are and things so it's it's uh, observe orientate decide and act um so you see something you observe it quick orientate or pivot towards it make a decision act on it and that would you know i think that's where creatives do actually suffer they're not not very good at those sort of quick you know move on move on move on so and that's something i've really learned over the years um so yeah that, that's my sort of piece of advice to everyone quick thinking it's interesting that you know beautifying beautifying the product actually didn't didn't change the conversion rate at all so you know, just photographing up flat on the table or scrunched up was absolutely fine. It um, works for them, right? You've got to change. Yeah. Each retailer, everyone's going to try something different, but that was just an extreme example. So don't take my word for it. Don't stop photography, but just <laughs> test it and experiment with it. And, 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 you know, things will catch you off guard and surprise you is, is kind of my point. Just don't, don't think narrow-minded, try everything, experiment. Yes, yeah, open mindedness and not to, not to be scared to just, you know, I suppose sometimes you're going to get things wrong, aren't you? But actually, you know, if you don't try it, you're not going to know. So, you know, just have the bravery to give it a go. Um, and, you know, let, let's let's see if it works. And if it doesn't, then that'll probably lead you on to make a decision in something else and try that. So exactly. I mean, how to, maybe it's a good intersection to Kate, but that safety aspect, you said fail. I want people to fail. I want them because if they're not failing, they're not experimenting, they're not trying hard yeah. enough to, to evolve. And so that safety in the business and to your clients is something that you like leaders should always try and push that. It's we will get things wrong. I would rather be in a meeting on how do we solve something that's just gone wrong than watching someone else kill your market share. So I think mm. that safety is really underplayed and that psychology, what you know, Kate's talking about, is something that business just aren't doing. They say a lot, but realistically, how many people will challenge a CEO, a, you know, a board to say that, that sucks, that, that decision is crazy, let's just try this, right? There's not many that, that do that and feel safe knowing that I'm not gonna get sacked. I'm gonna tell this person that they're, they're absolutely crazy. So. I think that's the biggest thing as well. So if you're a leader, please tell your team that they should be able to challenge you. They should be, you know, if you're not challenged, then you're not, you know, you're not doing yourself a, a service by being a leader. Um, if, and, and if you're not the leader, you should then go to your leaders and say, I, I think I should challenge you on this one and feel outspoken. But I think safety was a, a, a huge point that Kate brought up. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And just on that, Kate. So, preparing our graduates for, for the for for the future world. Yeah. No, George, I, I love I love your comment. It's it sort of um, it's straight away brought into my mind one of my uh, clients snack their uh, challenger brands uh, in a sofa market. Uh, and basically, the the founder is this kind of bonkers, you know, leader that's just yeah. Let's do, you know, quick minimum viable product. Let's try it, lean approach. Let's, you know, let's see if we're going to make a mistake. Great stuff. Everyone can challenge. Everyone has their point of view. It just kind of rolls and they grow like crazy. I mean, they are just over two years old. It's an amazing growth. It's, you know, uh, and, and it also reminded me about uh, my favorite um, leadership book, Legacy, about all black strategy. Um, really honestly recommend Legacy by James Kerr. It's um, the best leadership business book. Uh, but to respond to your question, Hannah, um, so I've been lecturing um, as a side thing for fun, um, including at LCF to lots of different students, um, both sort of graduates, masters, short courses and stuff. And one thing that um, 
that I've always found that they especially loved in my courses was how I was challenging them about an application of knowledge. And this was, was really getting them really good and really prepared for roles, which they were then getting quite more easily. Um, the thing uh, that, you know, that I always kind of do with the students is really kind of give them a lot of challenging tasks. And I don't just ask for generic kind of responses. I, I really push them because I know their potential is greater. I really ask them to search also much more widely, not just in the things, in the references that have been given to them, uh, but everywhere. Read all of the typical press. Oh my goodness, how many students do not read things like business or fashion? It's ridiculous. It's such a simple thing, but they don't. They, you know, it's like they're not interested themselves, you know, unless you're giving to them as a, you know, as a task. Uh, you know, same thing, be, you know, what you, Alex said, be really 